But Sauron of Mordor assailed them, and they made the last alliance of elves and men, and the hosts of Gil-galad and Elendil were mustered in Arnor. Thereupon Elrond paused a while and sighed. I remember well the splendor of their banners, he said. It recalled to me the glory of the Elder Days and the hosts of Beleriand. So many great princes and captains were assembled, and yet not so many, nor so fair, as when Thangorodrim was broken, and the elves deemed that evil was ended forever, and it was not so. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be taking a look at the war that ended the Second Age and shaped the Lord of the Rings, the War of the Last Alliance. We will start by discussing the forces and commanders of both sides of the war, before looking at the history of the war itself. As I often like to do, I'll link some related articles and videos below and in the cards above that are related to and helped with the creation of today's video. Thank you all for joining me today, let's begin our tale. During the War of the Last Alliance, there were two opposing factions facing off against one another, the Free Peoples, or Last Alliance, and Sauron's host. Concerning the Alliance, the last of the Numenorians, who were the first Gondorians and Arnorians, made up a great deal of the army, likely numbering in the thousands or tens of thousands. So too did the elves of Linden, Rivendell, Lorinand, soon to be called Lothlorien, and Greenwood the Great make up another large part of the force probably also numbering in the thousands or tens of thousands. The dwarves of khazad also fought in this alliance, but they numbered far less than the men and elves and provided no known commanders. There were also good birds and beasts on the side of the last alliance. Now concerning Sauron's forces, he had more forces than the Free Peoples did, for he had many orcs, Easterlings, Haradrim, dwarves that were not of the line of Durin, evil beasts and birds all of which together likely numbered in the tens of thousands or even more. Now looking at the commanders among men in the alliance, there were three. High King Elendil, who resided in Arnor in the north, and his sons Asildor and Anarion, who jointly ruled as kings of Gondor in Elendil's name. From the elves, High King Gilgalad had command over most of the elves, Elrond served as Gilgalad's herald and second in command, and Círdan the shipwright fought also. But King Omdir of Lorinad and King Orifer of Greenwood the Great led their elves, with Thranduil, son of Orifer, being there also. Amroth, son of Omdir, and Glorfindel may have also fought in this war as well, but it is unknown. So the Free Peoples had many great lords and commanders in their alliance. As for Sauron's host, Sauron and most likely his nine ringwraiths were the only notable commanders of this evil faction. Now that we know what each side looked like, let's begin discussing the history and battles that occurred within this war. Starting in 3429 of the Second Age and lasting through 3441, the War of the Last Alliance began at Minas Ithil, the fortress of Asildor, that would be known as Minas Morgul in the late Third Age. Sauron, who had been in Numenor during the time of its downfall, had returned to Mordor and rebuilt his strength, and he launched a surprise assault upon Minas Ithil. Asildor and his family escaped, and although the White Tree of Minas Ithil burned, Asildor collected a seedling of the tree before fleeing the city. Asildor and his family would sail down the Anduin, and sail north upon the sea and join his father Elendil in Arnor. Although it is not stated in the canon, I always like to think that this is the time when Asildor went back to the Stone of Erech to call upon the men of the White Mountains to fulfill their oaths, and they refused to fight Sauron and fled thus being cursed by Isildur and becoming the Oathbreakers. Anyway, after Isildur went north, Anari and his brother was hard-pressed to defend Gondor and all of the west while the Alliance gathered. Thus, Anari held out defenses in Osgiliath, while Sauron's true threat came from the north. In 3431, word of Sauron's attacks must have spread from Isildur into the north, for Gil-galad and Círdan marched their elves from Linden to Amansul or Weathertop to meet and join with Elendil and his army. In the Unfinished Tales, it is stated that Elendil swore an oath of alliance with Gil-galad, and invoked the name of Iru Iluvatar. Thus the light and power of the weapons Narsil and Aiglos joined, and the men and elves came to Elrond's refuge of Rivendell. For three years the host gathered and made plans and weapons in Rivendell, all while Anarion held Gondor against Sauron in the south. Asildor would leave his wife and newly born son Velondil in Rivendell until after the war, but he would never return from the south before he perished. Eventually the time would come to go south in the year 3434, and Gil-galad, Círdan, Elrond, and Elendil, 
and it's likely Glorfindel if he was involved, crossed the Misty Mountains over many passes and came into the Vales of Anduin. Then they marched south, and they would be joined by the Elves of the Greenwood, led by Orifer and Thranduil, the Elves of Lorinand, led by Amdir and possibly Amroth too, and the Dwarves of Khazad Dûm. With this mighty host, the Alliance marched southeast towards Mordor, coming through the brown lands which had once been the Garden of the Entwives, but was destroyed by Sauron's forces shortly before, for corn and many good things grew there. This makes me think Sauron destroyed the Entwives during the time of the War of the Last Alliance. Whether he did or didn't, if word reached the ears of the Fangorn about such destruction of the lands of the Entwives alone, I would imagine that the Ents would have also joined the Alliance against Sauron. But the Ents would not discover such tidings for a time. Anyway, the Alliance reached the plains of Dagorlad, and there they were joined by the forces of Anarion and Gondor. Thus the Battle of Dagorlad was joined, and Orifer would lead his ill-prepared elves to their doom, as they charged forward in battle before Gilgalad had given the command. Orifer would fall, and Thranduil would become the new king of the Greenwood. During the battle, King Omdir and his forces would be pushed out into the marshes, and he perished with half of his troops, creating the Dead Marshes. His son Omroth would be king for a time after him, until he too perished, and then Celeborn and Galadriel came into power in Lorinand, which would be called Lothlorien after Galadriel planted the Malorn trees. While the battle went ill for some, and it lasted days, the Alliance eventually had victory, for none could withstand the might of Narsil and Iclos. After the West pushed the orcs and their allies back into Mordor and somehow overcame the Black Gate, the seven-year siege upon Barad-dûr began. Isildur sent two of his sons, Eritan and Kyrion, and a force with them to take back Minas Ithil and guard the pass, so none escaped from Mordor from that way, while Isildur's eldest son, Elendur, stayed by his side. During the siege in 3440, a stone was cast from the Tower of Barad-dûr, and it struck Anarion slaying him, the son of Elendil and brother of Isildur. But the West fought on, and eventually the siege was pushed so tightly to Barad-dûr that Sauron himself emerged with the One Ring upon his finger. Sauron almost broke the siege single-handedly, and his forces pushed the Alliance back to the slopes of Mount Doom, and he came face to face with the High Kings of Elves and Men. Sauron fought Gilgalad and Elendil, and he slew both of them burning Gilgalad with the heat of his hand. It is unknown what became of his elven spear Iglos. Elendil was also defeated, and his sword broke beneath him. But in that hour, Isildur took up the broken hilt and blade of Narsil, and he cut the One Ring from Sauron's fingers. Thus Sauron's physical form perished, and he lost the war. Most of the orcs were routed and slain by the Alliance, and even though Elrond and Círdan advised Isildur to take the One Ring and cast it into the fires of Mount Doom, he did not do so. He took it as a war guild for the death of his father and brother. And so Barad-dûr was cast down, but its foundations remained, since they were made with the One Ring, and the Ring survived. So too did Sauron's spirit endure, and he hid in the east and regained his power, waiting to retake physical form once again. His servants among the Nine also hid and awaited their return, and so everyone returned home. Círdan would go to Linden, Elrond to Rivendell, and Thranduil to Mirkwood. If Glorfindel and Amroth did participate in the war, the former would have gone back to either Linden or Rivendell, and the latter back to Lorinand. After the war, Isildur went to Minas Anor, known as Minas Tirith in the later years of the Third Age, where his nephew and the future king of Gondor, Meneldil, lived and Isildur then took up the High Kingship of Gondor and Arnor. Isildur and his nephew would eventually build a tomb for Elendil, which afterwards would be called Amon Anwar, the Hill of Awe. More of his history may be found in my Isildur epic character history video. But we shall end our tale with Isildur planting another white tree, for he yet had the seedling of the white tree from Minas Ithil that he saved at the beginning of the war, and he planted it in Minas Anor, in memory of his brother Anarion. From the War of the Last Alliance, we see a common yet important and powerful theme from Tolkien's works. In the opposition of all things that wish harm and evil upon others, we are strongest with trusted friends and allies. Truly the strength of the alliance between all good peoples during this war was the only reason Sauron lost, and hope prevailed.
Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed today's video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about this war? Please let me know in the comments below. I think this war and its tale is a fascinating one, and its characters make it a story of valor, heroism, and friendship. Also, please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for a podcast and Discord server in the description below, and don't forget to subscribe to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I will see you all again next week with a video about the Ring of Barahir, its history, and its importance. As always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.